Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to um, our presentation this evening, which I know is going to be um, absolutely fantastic. Um, as usual, a uh, few rules of engagement, if that's OK. Um, please, can I request that you keep your um, your video off and your um, microphones muted? That would be absolutely super. Thank you. Um, uh, big brother that we are, we are able to um, do some of that ourselves if um, uh, if you forget. So uh, it's no major problem, but um, we would appreciate it. Um, so the quick advertisement, the wildlife worldwide advertisement, which you, which uh, those of you that have been on board um, previously have heard a number of times. Um, and that is, of course, that wildlife worldwide began in 1992. And um, Back in 1992, we were not organising any trips to the UK at all. Everything we were doing was to uh, far-flung parts of the earth, to um, to Africa, and then subsequently, of course, the Americas and Asia and all sorts of places. One of the wonderful things, um, I guess, um, about the last year, we have to take some positives from the last year, um, is that we've had an opportunity to uh, set up all sorts of amazing trips um, in and around the UK and um, we have set up some marvellous trips um, into Scotland and the uh, Somerset Levels and to Mull and the Shetland Islands and all sorts of lovely places around the UK um, and we're absolutely delighted to uh, have Mike on with us this evening, uh, the great Mike Dilger. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, if any or all of you have seen Mike on the one show but um, um, I did check to make sure that he wasn't on the one show this evening, because if he was on the one show, um, uh, he wouldn't have been with us here, I guess. Um, so uh, Mike uh, is a man of many parts. Um, he uh, has a, a very um, comprehensive knowledge of wildlife and of wildlife um, in many places, but particularly, I think it's fair to say, um, in the UK. Um, and uh, all of, of uh, in, in all corners of the UK, I should I should perhaps best say, um, and and of course Mike loves sharing his his great knowledge of, of wildlife here. Um, Mike has lived in some interesting places around the world, and he knows the tropics very well. Having spent um, some time in Ecuador, he's done stuff in Peru, um, has spent time in the Philippines and Tanzania and Vietnam and all sorts of amazing lovely wonderful places around the world um and i have to say i am very much looking forward to uh, to this evening's presentation by mike um because mike is going to be talking about places that i really don't know at all i can honestly say i don't know the somerset levels and i can honestly um say with some sadness that i don't yet uh, know uh, the wildlife in in scotland and i don't know scotland very well so uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, uh, to um, hearing Mike's presentation. Um, we will, as usual, have a question and answer session at the end of it all. Um, and uh, very much looking forward to that. Please do make use of your chat facility. Um, there is a chat facility for those of you that are unaware. Um, if you are on a computer or a laptop, I'm... Um, Pretty sure you'll find it at the bottom of your screen, but you can click on chat um, and messages will come to me directly and I will be able to um, pose those to Mike at the end of the presentation. Um, and uh, some of the questions I might be able to answer myself, but I'm actually pretty sure I'm going to put most of them to Mike um, at the end of the presentation. Um, and um, if we have any technical issues, then I will jump in. Um, um, and uh, Mike and I will endeavour to resolve them. Needless to say, we've had a dry run um, um, earlier and um, with any luck, you won't have any Nick Garbutt style issues to address. So um, Mike, um, I know you're there behind that red screen. Um, so there we are. Um, <laughs> hey Mike, um, really lovely to have you on board. Um, I think um, probably worth saying at this point to uh, to uh, uh, our good friends that are with us. I know you've got one or two bits of video. You and I have tested this. We know that um, we know that it works. It works beautifully. Um, for 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 people that are unfamiliar with having 
uh, video presented in this way. Sometimes it's a little bit jumpy. It just depends on the speed of download that you've got at your end. Um, but uh, but we know that it's working. We know that it's super. And I've seen a couple of bits of video and it's fab. Mike, I'm going to hand over to you. Mr. Breen, thank you, sir. All the best. Uh, very nice to hear your dulcet tones. And um, <laughs> first and foremost, thank you so much, Chris, uh, Dan Free, Chris Smith, and all my pals at um, Wildlife Worldwide and the Travelling Nash for inviting me to come and talk to you lovely folk about a couple of locations that I'm incredibly passionate about. I was thinking about the talk this afternoon and I realised that one of them is at zero degrees, um, zero metres, flat as a pancake. The other part is the highest part of Britain. So I'll be taking you from the levels to the highlands and right back home again. We're going to cover the full altitudinal range of, um, of the British Isles. But absolutely delighted. I think we've, we've got a really cracking number, Chris. So um, I'll get started. So, I, mean, um, I work as a freelancer, so I'm not a BBC member of staff. So I don't do presenting all the time. I do a day here, a day there. And I've always done lots of other things as well. So I do a lot of writing for BBC Wildlife magazine. But I had a meeting with a chap called Christopher Breen a few years ago. And I'd been up to um, the, the Grand Times Hotel in Scotland and done a lot of celebrity guided holidays and found I bloody loved guide, guiding and hanging out with people. And I've always got spare time because my television schedule can be moved around. Uh, and I said to Chris, I'd like to do some trips. And um, he said, all right, Dilge, where do you want to go? Uh, and I said, well, the, bizarrely, the two places I know are completely different. They're the levels, because I live near the Somerset levels, and also the highlands of Scotland. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to have a crack at those, please. So I've led quite a few trips down at the levels now and loads last autumn. And I want to take you on a, on a wonderful journey. Um, so here we are, here's the British Isles. I have been almost everywhere, courtesy of the one show. If you look at the outer Hebrides there, you can see Barra, Bebecula, South Uist, North Uist, Harris, Lewis. There's the Shants inside, there's the, there's the uh, St Kilda, there's the Sula Scare. I've been to all of them, courtesy of the one show. And hopefully I'll be going up to Shetland soon with them, with, um, with uh, um, Wildlife for Wide. So I'm really looking forward to that trip. So I am very lucky. I am incredibly well traveled around. But I mean, home is where your heart is. And um, I moved down to Bristol uh, to get a job in telly back in 1999. And soon I found out the, the, the ornithological mecca that is the Somerset levels. I mean, look at that. That is flipping beautiful. And you can't really see the nature reserves there, but the levels, as it suggests, are very level. They're, they're quite often at, uh, at sea level, or some places they're just slightly below sea level. But it is an incredibly rich habitat. So if we're looking at a map here, I live just by, you can see right at the top corner, there you can see Chew Valley Lake. So that little blob uh, right at the top. So I live at the top of that lake, and then you've got the Mendip. So when I go to Birdwatch uh, in the Somerset Levels, I hop over the Mendips and then that huge area. So the Mendips basically is a huge lowland area of wetland and coastal grazing marshes, sandwiched between the Mendips, the Quantocks, the Blackdown Hills further over. And um, the Polden Hills you can see is a small ridge of hills. So you get the North Somerset Levels, which are drained by the River Axe and the River Brew, and you get the south, southern levels, which are drained by the River Parrot through Bridgewater. So we get a chance when we're coming, I've, I've done loads of filming down there, and I love to leading the trip to the Somerset Levels. We get a chance to kind of visit all over the whole area, the north levels and the south levels, going into the Polden Hills to go birding as well, and the very, very edge of the Quantocks we might visit too. I mean, it's just an incredibly biodiverse site, and I love being there. Um, Generally, when we've, we've, we've uh, been on the Somerset Levels trips with uh, Wildlife for Wide and TTN, uh, we stay in the Swan Hotel in Wells. Um, it's a really well-known, famous hotel, looking like a wintry wonderland here. And if you've got one of the windows at the front, then you get that view. That is Wells Cathedral um, to look out on. So you know, Wells is really, really close to the Somerset Levels. So quite often when we meet up, then people have a little wander around and see the cathedral and take in Wells before we sit down and have our first evening meal and chat about all the amazing wildlife we're going to see. Um, wherever you go on the levels, 
you see Glastonbury Tor. It's an amazingly uh, distinct landmark because it sticks up um, like a sore thumb and because the levels are so flat. I mean, the levels are massive. We're talking something like 650 square kilometers. Uh, it's drained by those rivers. And um, it's, it's, it's effectively been exploited since Neolithic times. The oldest wooden trackway across it goes back to 3,800 BC. So people have been using the levels for best part of 5,000 years. Um, back then, of course, it was a wild, untamed swamp. It was a no-go zone for many people. Um, it had malaria there. There were probably amazing kind of aurochs and, and beavers and astonishing array of wildlife. And although we haven't got that level of biodiversity, it is still pretty flipping good. And we were talking 32 triple SIs, uh, site of special scientific interest, and 12 special protection areas within the levels. And this is a view, when you, you come down to the levels, you'll see Glastonbury Tor, and that's Glastonbury Tor from RSPB Ham Wall, which probably for my money is the jewel in the crown. The lovely thing about the levels is that they're managing all the conservation organisations, be it the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust, Natural England, the Forest Commission, whoever, the Hawk and Owl Trust are there as well. They're all managing the same water level and quite often the reserves are contiguous. So they're all right next to each other. So they're all working together for the betterment and particularly the Avalon Marshes, which includes Shapwick, Ham Wall and um, some of the Somerset Wildlife Trust sites. They're all joined together effectively and it's in fantastic nick. The Avalon Marshes is, is rewilding. It's habitat on a grand scale. And you can see amazing stuff there that you can't see elsewhere. I mean, look at that. That's beautiful. Um, and whenever I go to the spring trips, I know we've got a couple of trips, hopefully, uh, planned for May. If I'm trying not to use the, the, um, the pandemic, I don't want to use the C word throughout the whole of this trip because it's going to be nice and positive. But hopefully, if we get a chance to go, we've got a couple of trips booked uh, in late May. And um, this is the view you're going to get in late May. And But for me, I, I'm absolutely mad for birdsong. I love the sound of places like this. And just listen to this. It's beautiful. It's the best place for seeing cuckoo in Britain. If there's a better place, I'd like to know about it. Wickham Fen is not bad in Cambridgeshire, but the Somerset levels, Hamwall and Shatwick, I mean, you are guaranteed to see cuckoo. You're guaranteed to hear bittens booming. It's also one of the very few places where this bird is breeding, the great white egret. I mean, it, it's starting to spread to other big wetland areas as well, but this is still really the best place to see great white egrets. I mean, really, the Somerset levels are the heron capital of Britain. You can see um, grey heron, bittern, absolutely. Great white egret, little egret. Uh, cattle egret is another species that we have had every single time we've been down to the levels. It's probably the only place you can really go and see seeing cattle egret. There's also been um, purple heron there recently, and um, the other one, uh, Little Bittern, is the only place where Little Bittern has bred, although I still haven't seen it, I've only heard it. So, I mean, it is really the heron capital of Britain. Um, it's also one of the best places to see, um, see common cranes, grus grus, that beautiful bugling call. This is, um, this is a, a flock that has been reared at, at, at Wildfire and Wetlands Trust in Slimbridge with the RSPB. And they've released them now and they're actually breeding. It's a wild flock. They go where they want. They spend the whole year on the levels. The only other place really you can guarantee to see cranes is over in Norfolk with, uh, with uh, Nick, who I know um, does loads of tour leading over there. And he's a stellar, stellar young man. Um, so really Norfolk and the Somerset levels, but the flocks you can see, I always think it's like a plank cross with a pool cue when you see them and seeing them throw back their head and you do their bugling call is brilliant. Every, every time we've been down, 
certainly in the spring and summer, we will catch uh, the, the cranes. And with a bit of luck, we might even hear them bugling. So cranes are a real feature of the Somerset levels. I mean, come on, bitten. I mean, back in the day, they used to have four or five species, four or five, they reckon at the nadir, should I say, there were probably only four or five individuals booming in Britain in the 70s and 80s. But now they've gone through the roof. And of course, Titchwell and Ninsmere, Norfolk and Suffolk used to be, or East Anglia, used to be the place to see, um, to see and hear bittern. But there were over 70 males booming across the Avalon marshes, which is more than the whole of East Anglia. And bitterns need big, expansive reed beds with eels in and fish and frogs and, and, and lots of food and lots of diverse reed stands, open areas, a bit of scrub, uh, lots of channels. So, I mean, the sunset levels are perfect for this fabulous, fabulous species. Um, the other great thing as well is I'm, uh, I'm actually one of, I wear a number of hats and um, one of my hats is president of the British Dragonfly Society. So I absolutely love my dee flies and up in, uh, uh, down in the levels, uh, they're, they're mind blowing. Go May, June, you can see a whole raft of species. And this is one of the real special uh, dragonflies of the Somerset levels. And if we're there in late May, on a sunny day, we will definitely catch up with this. This is the hairy hawker or the hairy dragonfly. If you look at the thorax there, you can see how beautifully hairy it is. It's Brachytron pretense. Now this flies along the ditches or dikes or as the, in Somerset they call them reams. And the best sighting uh, you'll ever see is these flying along the, the ditches and hobbies coming down and trying to nail them. I've seen hundreds of hobbies on the Somerset levels because what happens is they, they tend to come in quite often to the Stour in Dorset and the Somerset levels are the two big places. So in May, you can guarantee hobbies. I've actually looked in the sky and seen 25, 30 in one view. So we can guarantee hobbies in spring. And what they're doing is that they're after, they're after the hobbies. So they will scream down and try and grab um, the, the dragonflies because the hairy hawk is one of the few early dragonflies that comes out. Um, so they'll try and catch these hairy hawkers. So in May, every chance of seeing hairy hawkers and hairy hawkers being caught by hobbies, which is, believe me, an amazing sight. Uh, all I'll say is good luck taking a photograph because <laughs> they're flipping quick. Um, lots of other dragonflies as well. This is um, there's a big central drain right across Shapwick and Ham Wall. And this is a beautiful little specialist critter. Uh, this is the red eyed damselfly. And they often, this one's laying, it's got, they're quite, quite sexist. It's quite a pugilist world, the, um, the dragonfly world. And they kind of grab the female around the back of the neck and then fly around with her while she's laying eggs. And these usually end up sitting on the big lily pads on the, on the central drain through Shabrick and Ham Wall. So on a sunny day, we shall get red eyed damselfly, no problem. Lots of, lots of butterflies, of course. Uh, this is a gatekeeper, more of a summer butterfly. Um, but every chance of seeing a whole raft of really exciting invertebrates on a nice warm day across the levels. Uh, of course, I, um, I think the levels is one of the few places, in my opinion, where you can go any month of the year and you can see amazing stuff. Um, that's why I do trips in spring and also in autumn and also in the dead of winter. I think the only other two places really are the Highlands of Scotland and Norfolk in my conceited opinion, <laughs> as to the best places for seeing wildlife in Britain. Um, and this is winter, of course. This is a nice wintry shot. Uh, I think that's on Ham Wall. Um, yes, it is definitely Ham Wall. That's near the, um, near the, near the big tower hide. Um, and it's a different flavor, a completely different flavor when you come to Somerset levels. It's, you obviously don't get the butterflies, the dragonflies. Um, there's not much bird song, but it's, all, it's a wild fowl and way to heaven. Look at this, this lovely shot of a, a whole blast of widgeon coming, uh, fl flushing out of the reed bed. Of course, these birds will be breeding, a small number of breeding in Britain, but most of these widgeon will be coming down from Arctic Russia, uh, from Nenets Autonomous Province and, uh, and, and, the, and the areas up there, the Arctic tundra, and they come down to the Somerset levels in huge numbers. And of course, they call widgeon the whistling widgeon, so they go, Beautiful. And you get a prr, prr of the tail, prr, prr, and you get a eh, 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 of the gadwall. I love wildfowl. So if you love your wildfowl, you love big spectacles, 
And they look at their best in winter, of course, because they've just molted after the breeding season. So the shoveler, the widgeon, the gadwall, the teal, the pintail will be looking absolutely beautiful. Uh, uh, certainly in the, uh, in the January trips that I lead down to the levels. I mean, January is an amazing, amazing month for wildfowl. And also for waders as well. Uh, this is one of the specialist ones that you get down uh, in the autumn particularly. And also if you're hanging around in the winter, this is the black-tailed godwit. So all the, um, virtually all the uh, Icelandic black-tailed godwits overwinter in Britain. Some of them then leak further south and go down to kind of France and even down to kind of Africa. But you'll get a good number of black-tailed godwit. It's one of my favourites. I mean, superficially, this is, they come in some plumage here but they're looking more in winter plumage, more gray. But when they explode, because black tail god and bar tail god, it looks superficially similar. But then you get that massive flash of white in the wing and that beautiful white rump. So then you know you've got a black tail god. So wildfowl and wader heaven. You get some good waders, of course, in the spring and summer. So you get lapwing and snipe and, uh, but also, but I mean, a different level of uh, species in the winter. Um, autumn. And winter is amazing for the Somerset levels for starlings. I think it's probably, I mean, great white egrets, cattle egrets, good chance of otters. Um, there's, there's lots of stuff to see, but most people who come down there want to see this. I mean, there are lots of murmurations all over the UK, but fact, Somerset levels has the biggest and the best. Um, this is, this, these are a few photographs I took um, for, for wildlife were wide so they could publicize the tour. And I'm a crap photographer, I'll say, but you can't fail with taking amazing pictures of, um, of, of the murmurations. They're absolutely mind blowing. Um, sometimes it, it, it's difficult to know the, the, the exact population. Generally murmurations can be anywhere between a thousand birds to 50,000, 60,000 being the average, but they reckon the Somerset levels sometimes can have one and a half million birds. I said to one of the wardens once, he came up with a great line. I said, how, how do you try and count those birds when you're trying to estimate the kind of population? He goes, oh, it's easy, Mike. All you do is you count the number of wings and you divide by two. Ah, oh, flipping hell. But anyway, I don't know, guess how many, how many there are. It's like how many sweeties are there in a jar at the, at the, for the Christmas fate? I mean, there's a, there's a good million there easily. It's absolutely belted. Um, so there you go. That's go, worth going down for that. And none of them are, are ever the same. Each one's different. It's better when it's cold and it's clear. If it's windy or rainy, they will still murmurate, but not for as long. But I, every time I go down, it's different. And also what you can do is you can go in the morning and then see them leaving the reese beds. And no one does that. And I often take the, take the clients down to do that. And that is belting as well. They just lift off as one and then just kind of go out in the countryside to feed for the day. So the, the starling memorations are out of this world. Um, and of course, um, marsh harries, it's great for birds of prey, even spring and summer and autumn, winter. You can guarantee to see marsh harries at any time. And the great thing about the, the murmuration is you've got a one and a half million birds. There's always predators to turn up. I see sparrowhawks every time. Casey will get a merlin coming in. Peregrines will frequently turn up to try and nick a starling. Marsh harriers often quarter the reed beds afterwards to see if there's any dead birds there they can grab or a dopey one that they can, they can snatch off the top of a Phragmites reed head. So birds of prey are flipping brilliant there. Uh, and you can certainly guarantee marsh harrier uh, and, um, and quite a few other species. Well, kestrel, tawny owl, I've even seen hunting um, hunting the uh, starlings there as well. There's a lot of food there for them to go for. Um, so yeah, beautiful place. Uh, it's picturesque, very photogenic. The wildlife always delivers. I um, mean, spring and summer and the winter, autumn winter trips are very different. They've got a great flavor. They've got their highs and they've got their key species, but always, always delivers for wildlife. So um, I want to show you a little clip now um, I, I was lucky enough during lockdown to do a few films with my boy Zachary, this is my boy who's just turned eight, and this is our dog Bramble, this is up on, on the Murray coast actually, this is a place called Colbin Forest, looking at the Murray Firth, where uh, just off to the right is where we take clients, and we regularly see common scoter, velvet scoter, long-tailed duck, uh, and very, this whole coast is amazing for bottlenose dolphin, 
right in the corner there, you can see Berg Head. And that is probably the best place for seeing Purple Sandpiper and also Bottlenose Dolphin. And also off Berg Head last year, we had, we had um, uh, basking sharks with some of the, some of the world, wildlife worldwide groups. So that whole area is flipping brilliant. But anyway, I just want to say, we, um, during lockdown, not much filming was going on for, for me, but the one show contacted me and said, um, we know your son's really keen. We'd like to do a few films about father and son uh, trying to see, appreciate wildlife on their own doorstep. So we did a film in our back garden from dawn till dusk, right in the heart of lockdown, looking at the birds and we have lesser horseshoe bats in our garage. And then they said they love the film and can we have another one? And I said, what about, what about going down to the Somerset levels? And the one show is uh, called Critical Broadcast by the BBC, which means that I'm allowed to go filming even in lockdown. And obviously we take sensible precautions. Um, but this is a film highlighting how wonderful the Somerset levels are. Um, we couldn't get into Hamwall because it was closed, but this is Shatwick Heath, which is the Hamwall and Shatwick are probably the two key sites in the Somerset level. So uh, you'll see a flavour of the stuff that, you know, if you come with us or if you go down on your, on, your, on your own, or if you've been to the levels before, this is the kind of wildlife that you'll see in spring. So this is me and Zachary having a fantastic day out, uh, courtesy of the wine show. And this is what it's like when you're hanging out there in spring and summer. <laughs> As a bird enthusiast, there are many sites that have enthralled me over the years. Oh, there it goes, flying. Wonderful. And my seven-year-old son, Zachary, is a chip off the old block. We've got a special mission today. Put the helmets in. Let's go! We're going on a bike ride in search of some rare birds. And Shatwick Heath National Nature Reserve in Somerset is the perfect place to look for them. And there's one particular thing that Zachary has never seen before, which is... Bitten! <laughs> you don't make life easy, do you? That's a tricky one. If we're lucky, we might see birds of prey like marsh harriers or maybe even a hobby. As well as being home to lots of wildlife, it's also great for bikes here. Zachary, do you know why they call this place the Somerset Levels? Because it's level? Because it's flat as a pancake. Come on, race you. Go! Come on! Because it's so flat, sounds travel right across the reserve. And some of them are just wonderful. But, um... So it's only the males that are calling. And do you know why they're calling? Um, to tell other males yeah. that this is my patch of weeds and also trying to get a lady. <laughs> a lady? Absolutely. It's pretty tricky to see them amongst the weeds. But if we're patient... Bit of flying there. Have you got it, Zachary? Yeah, got it. Oh, I see that. It's super secretive because it likes to spend most of its life in the reed beds, hiding away. With wildlife all around, there's time to stop and see what comes to us. Plus, it's a chance to rest our weary legs. We've had a good morning, haven't we? Yeah. It's getting warmer now, have you noticed? We're starting to see lots more insects. Yeah, I've seen dragonfly, butterfly, and yeah. damselfly. And it's after the hobby! Hobby! See it, Zachary? Yeah, I can see it. It's after dragonflies and damselflies. Yeah. And it's like a mini peregrine falcon, but it's not here all year, is it? No, it's in Africa. What a brilliant sighting. That is a special bird. Well done. <laughs> We're certainly not done yet, though. There's plenty more to see. Look at that. Bright pastas. Great white egret. Great white egret. Massive, aren't they? Even taller than you, probably, I'd say. They're about that high when they stop, they're craning their neck up. And actually, that's an incredibly rare bird. When I was a child, I would never have seen great white egrets. They've only really started breeding in Britain in the last 10 years. 
And as the day warms up, it's all going on. Daddy, what's that? A good bird. Come on. You see it? It's a marsh harrier. Well, spot exactly. That's a male marsh harrier. Oh, it's chasing off a crow. Oh, cool. Isn't that amazing? Once threatened with near extinction in the UK, these magnificent birds are now a regular sight around our weed beds and marshes. And as our bike ride comes to an end, it's time to take stock of what we've seen. Best moment for you? Marsh area. For me? Hobby. Grab your helmet. Let's go! Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, oops, already seen that. But there we go. Just a slight glitch there when I have uh, fat fingers pressing the wrong buttons. Um, you can see there um, that my son is, is is probably much better than me on in in, in television. And um, I'm going to hand over the mantle to him, the presenting mantle over to him at some point. Uh, but. I'm joking aside, it's a wonderful place to hang out. And we saw so much stuff that day. The one show films were only four minutes long and trying to get all the amazing stuff we saw into four minutes was really, really difficult. So yeah, you're down at sea level at the moment. I'm gonna take you right up to the highlands of Scotland. Um, I mean, kind of you'll be going up altitude wise and also latitude wise. Um, I would say, even though uh, the Somerset levels I know really well. I mean, the Highlands for me are my home from home. It's my second home. I've probably filmed at least a hundred separate one show films from there. Um, I've been all over kind of filming Ospreys and Eagles and uh, Ptarmigan, Dottrell. I mean, I've kind of been Pine Martins, Otters. I've been lucky to see most of the stuff up there. Um, and I absolutely love the Highlands. Um, and Whenever I go up to the Highlands, be it the celebrity guided holidays, run out of the Grand Thomas Hotel, or the trips to Wildlife for a Wide and the Travelling Naturalist, we always start at the Grand Thomas Hotel. This is, for my money, the best hotel in Britain. It's a wildlife hotel. Uh, almost all the clients who stay there are into watching wildlife. They do wildlife talks there. The staff are really knowledgeable about wildlife. They have in-house guides who are just terrific at giving you information about where to see stuff. Um, so whenever I say to, to Dan Free and Chris Smith and Chris Green, when, I, when they were organising, I say, like, please, can we stay there? It's an amazing hotel, great food, really warm welcome, right in the heart of Speyside, in Granton upon Spey. And it's just a super, super hub to, to base our whole list from. Um, so I, I've been, I've stayed in virtually every room in that hotel. I know it looks back in the end. It's a super, super hotel. I'm going to start going through a variety of the habitats now because, I mean, it's such a rich place, uh, Speyside and the Highlands. Uh, you've got the Caledonian pine forest, the ancient pine forest. You've got the moorlands. You've got the mountains. You've got the Murray coast. So you've got all that coastal area and the fantastic estuary. Um, it's just such a rich and biodiverse site with many species that, of course, we can't see south of the border, be they crested tit or Scottish crossbill or golden eagle, um, or, or until very recently, white-tailed eagle. So, I mean, all these species, lots of plants as well that you've got no chance of seeing south of the border. And I absolutely bloody love going to the Highlands of Scotland. It's just, it really is my second home. Um, so anyway, these are, this, this, this is a fantastic view of Abernethy RSPB Reserve, their second biggest reserve uh, the biggest one actually is Forsenard up in the, in the flow country in Caithness and Sutherland. Uh, but this is their second biggest. And this is the best chunk of primary, pr uh, prime uh, spotting territory for things like Crested Tit, Scottish Crossbill, Capricaylee, Pine Martin, Red Squirrel, all the species we know and love and want to see. So, I mean, it makes my heart sing seeing a picture like that. It's just, it's just a beautiful forest. Um, I'm a very, very keen botanist, um, and I'm actually uh, writing a book this year about trying to see as many wild plants as possible. So I'll be doing uh, a lot of botanising this year. Certainly up in Scotland, I'm, I'm planning on spending quite a bit of time 
hopefully with uh, Well for Wide, if you know what, disappears. Uh, and this for me is one of the most famous plants. Um, it's twin flower, you can see why it's called twin flower, but its Latin name is Linnea borealis. Um, Carl Linnaeus is the modern father of taxonomy, nomenclature. He came up with a binomial system, so you got kind of, you know, you got phylum, class, orders, family, genus and species. He came up with that systematic list and it was one of his favourite flowers, so it was named after Carl Linnaeus. Linnea borealis, and then boreal is of course the boreal forest, the tiger forest right across northern Russia and Karelia and Norway and Finland and Sweden, and you get the little blob up in Scotland as well, which is the Caledonian pine forest. So seeing um, seeing twin flower for me was a dream come true when I saw it about ten years ago, and and I'll make a point of uh, showing the clients uh, the twin flower when we were up there. Certainly in in June and July is a it's just a beautiful plant. Um, this is a species that everybody wants to see. A birders, the crested tit, of course, I mean, quite common on the continent, but only confined to Caledonian pine forest in the British Isles. It's an absolute bobby does. So it's got that little perky crest. It's like a pugnacious little character. And every single trip I've led up there, we have seen this. And the key is to listen for their call. I'm always the first to spot it, and that's, I, I, I'm the guide, so I suppose I should be spotting it really. But once you know the call, you can listen out, and I go, oh, Crest of coming in, and they're like, where, where, where? And it's because I know the call, and this is the call. A little dry trill is perfect. So I take people to see the crested tits and they get, they're so excited. And it's actually a bird you can photograph really easily. It's one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the ones you can get great photographs of. And then I say, come watch this trick. And the crested tits at the car park in Loch Garten are uniquely tame. I have never seen this anywhere else. So we show them the crested tits and they're like, oh, it's flipping brilliant. And then I say, watch this. I sprinkle some on my baldy head. And then the cold tits will come onto my head, onto my hand. Um, and quite often the, crest, the cold tits steal the show. So at the end of the day, you say, what was your best moment? And um, most people say cold tit rather than crested tit. So not only do you see a rare bird, you see a, amazing behavior. So this is my friend Simon took this picture of me with a, with a, with a cold tit on my hand. And you know, that's guaranteed. I'm telling you now, in winter, that is guaranteed. And I don't like to guarantee much because wildlife is gloriously unpredictable. It's a bit of a dangerous game. So in, in spring and summer, it's a bit, a bit harder because there's lots of food out in the, in, the, um, in the forest for them and they're busy feeding their youngsters and they feed their youngsters caterpillars and invertebrates. But when they're hungry in the winter, when it's really cold in the pine forest, that is guaranteed. Um, my good friend, Nicholas Garbert. Nicholas Garbert has just entered the waiting room. We should admit him because just in time to see his picture with Wildlife for Wild for a long time and, um, and I'm a relative newbie, but um, fantastic picture, Nick. Um, also, I think probably the key species that everybody wants to see is the pine martin. Um, out of the five trips I, I led uh, in the autumn, we saw them on four occasions. We just missed out on one, which is a real shame. Um, there's a hide that we have exclusive access to um, where they bait for badgers, we get badgers every time, and also pine martins. So, I mean, pine martin is just one of the megas. It's right up there with golden eagle and, and crested tit and, and red squirrel. So, uh, pine martin, I mean, given, you know, if, if we're talking probably 80% chance based on last autumn. A bit more difficult in the summer, but certainly when it gets a bit colder, when the food is a bit sparse, then the pine martins really come in and they've got a terrible penchant for peanut butter and jam and, um, and and they'll come down to that so very very good chance of pine martins um, of course most people go up for the monarch of the glen uh, the red deer but roe deer are really common up in the forest as well this is an absolutely gorgeous gorgeous picture of a, of a male buck roe deer um, so we'll, we'll definitely get a chance to catch up particularly in the valleys uh, down near the Granton on Spey, near the river An near the river Spey in the Anagach Woods, we've got a very good chance of catching up with roe deer. So um, that's one of the one of the star species. But also as well, we um, 
uh, oh, I've just jumped, a, I've just slightly got my slides out of order. So we should definitely get uh, red deer. But in terms of invertebrates, this is one of the real specialized subjects, specialized invertebrates of the North. This is the Northern damselfly. And you can see, if you look at the second abdominal segment, which is the, you've got the head, the thorax, then you've got the long abdomen, and the second abdominal segment looks a little bit like a mushroom. And if you see one with a little mushroom and you're up in the Highlands of Scotland, then you've got Northern damselfly. Um, uh, plants, I'm, I'm going to be seeing this plant when I'm up in, in Scotland in, in June and July. Uh, this is creeping ladies, no, this is coral root orchid, sorry, coral root orchid, because the, the actual bulb of the orchid looks like a little piece of coral. And it's one of the, it's, 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 it's almost impossible to catch up with in England. I don't think it's in Wales, but there's a few key sites I know uh, in, in and around um, Boat of Garton and Nethy Bridge where we should be able to catch up with, um, with coral root orchid. And it's, uh, people love orchids. It's like an honorary bird. I mean, they might not be into plants, but they, they want to see an orchid. So that's a really spectacular orchid. Moving away from the forests, I think actually looking at this picture, this is, um, this is one of the clients. I think it might be a lady called Helen who does, uh, I don't know if Helen's uh, out there, if she is. Hi, Helen. Um, she's a keen, mad keen photographer and she's standing out in the middle of the estuary. This is Fintorn Bay. So we've moved now from uh, Speyside up to the, um, up to the coast. Uh, the, Murray, the whole of the Murray coast is just wonderful uh, for all manner of stuff. It's brilliant for sea duck in the winter. Uh, it's fantastic for, hugely important for geese, very important for wildfowl and also for waders as well. And you can see great stuff in the, in the spring and summer here. In the spring and summer, this is the place where ospreys go to, go to catch fish. Uh, they often, you know, everyone, everyone assumes they kind of hunt in the rivers, but they go to the estuaries. The old name of osprey, of course, was mullet hawk because they used to feed on grey mullet, which is, a, is, was a, is an estuarine fish. Um, so I've seen osprey uh, 50, 60 metres up hovering like kestrels and they've got the most astonishing eyesight and they belt in and, and catch a mullet. Um, so coming here, you get amazing views. You, we, what we do is we actually wait till low tide and we march right out into the middle of the estuary so we can get really close to things like golden plover, all the Brent geese, the, um, the pink footed geese, which is the famous species on the, on the Murray coast and lots of wildfowl like pintail. Um, and, and you get a chance to get, get really close to uh, and be immersed in wildfowl, waders and geese, which is wonderful. So. This is a picture we took last, I, I took like, uh, last autumn. Um, there we go, look at that, that's, oh, that's beautiful. I love geese, I love geese. They'll go wink, 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 wink. The pink footed geese when they fly over. But seeing 10,000 of them flying over your head is a truly wondrous sight. Uh, they tend to fly in these long skeins. And I interviewed this wonderful guy um, who's the RSPB warden down at Snettersham where they get the pink footed geese slightly later in the winter. Um, and he said it's like avian graffiti when you see the long string pearls of um, geese moving between the estuary, like Fintorn Bay, where they'll um, spend the night. Then they go and feed in the, in the wheat fields and the barley fields all around the very rich farmland around the Murray coast. So quite often you get them flying right over your head, which is wonderful. Uh, lots of places we can go to and, and get a really brilliant goose experience all around the Murray coast. Um, and of course, the Murray Coast is famous for being one of only two places in Britain that has a resident population of bottlenose dolphins. The other one is Cardigan Bay in West Wales. But this is Channonry, this is taken at Channonry Point. Channonry Point is probably the best place in Britain from the mainland to see bottlenose dolphins, particularly on a rising tide where the, where the um, sea is coming into the Fintorn Bay. Um, and that basically the uh, Channonry Point just like sticks out like a little elbow right in, into the heart of um, into the heart of the estuary and we go right to the point and I've seen them jumping out catching fish smacking fish out of the water so at the right time at the right time of the year certainly it's, it's hard in the hardest part of winter but spring through to autumn you've got a very good chance on a rising tide of either seeing it at places like Berghead or catching it coming into um, coming in past Channery Point and seeing the little babies like rugby balls oh. I want to squeeze them. They're absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, every chance to sing something like this. That's the Murray Coast behind. And bottlenose joys, bottlenose dolphins, 
dolphins leaping for joy. Uh, quickly, I'm, I'm going to, about five minutes before we finish, Chris, um, take you up into the moorlands, wonderful craggy moorlands up all around the highlands, be it kind of around Cairngorm or further, further west, uh, if you go out to the Western Isles or further south of Cairngorm. And of course, um, you get amazing, amazing invertebrates. Here's the mountain ringlet, our only montane butterfly, which we'll certainly see in June and July if we go to the right places and we get some half decent weather. Um, the red grouse. Uh, every single trip we've seen red grouse. We often go out of, um, out of uh, Granton on Spey and cross Loch Endorb and Dover Moor because Dover, Loch Endorb is a small loch which is one of the best locations for black throated divers. So you can, you can go and see black throated divers in their full art deco black breeding plumage because they are absolutely belting birds. Um, and uh, as we go to see the black throated divers, we always catch up with a few, few red grouse just wandering through. Every time I think of red grouse, I want to have a wee dram of whiskey. And in the bar at Grand Tunnel Spade, there's about 70 different whiskeys. So if you like whiskey, you'll be, you'll be laughing. Um, red deer, the monarch of the glen. Um, when we have the trips in autumn, uh, one of the groups last, a couple of the groups last time had hit it spot on for the rut. So you go up to probably my favourite place is the Monoliths, uh, which is just kind of northwest of the Cairngorm. And Raptor Valley is, is the best place for, I think, for Golden Eagle in Britain. It's, I've seen about 12 species of raptor in one visit down there. It's absolutely belting. And so you go down the valley, down the Monolia, so you actually go up the valley, should I say. And at the right time, the red deer are on the hills above the valley, and you can hear them going, And roaring away. It's just a wonderful, wonderful sound. Edwin Land says, look at that. That's not my picture, unfortunately, but I do have that's nice, isn't it? So you get uh, we we were we had a fantastic day where we went down to um a, a place just which I didn't know very well, but I know much better now. I got a tip off that it's brilliant for red deer. Uh, so we went down, went down there, um, southwest of uh, Lagan. Uh, not far really from, from uh, Grant on, on Spey, probably an hour away. And we had roe deer, we had red deer roaring, and we also had brilliant views of seeker deer. So three species of deer in one day. That was one of my real favorite days up in, up in the Highlands last year, because I haven't seen seeker deer very often. So now I know where they are, then we've got a good chance of seeing, having a three deer day, which is a good day by anyone's rec recollection, I think. Uh, golden eagles. Um, eagles, I mean, every single trip we've been on, we've seen golden eagle and white-tailed eagle. I can't guarantee you seeing this close. Sometimes the views can be a bit distant, but certainly down Strathdurn or Fintorn Valley or Raptor Valley, we see golden eagles pretty regularly. And, you know, those huge big fingers, that massive, people, all the time, they, people see buzzards. Buzzards are really common then. They go, is that a buzzard? Is that an eagle? I was like, buzzard. Is that an eagle? Buzzard. And then when an eagle turns up, they're like, it's an eagle. There's massive fingers. It's like makes a buzzard look like a like a gnat. They're just wonderful. So just before we finish, I want to show you um a quick film. I know I'm slightly running over, Chris. I hope that's okay. A quick film of um golden eagles up in Scotland, which I filmed for the wine show a few years ago. And you might not be able to see it this close, but it just gives you a flavour of just how magnificent they are and and how wonderful the Highlands are. A golden eagle soaring high. These days a rare sight in most of the UK. But here in the Scottish Highlands, there are still some breeding pairs left. And two eagle chicks being raised in this valley are almost ready for their very first flight from the nest. But before they fly, we have a chance to enlist this pair for a special mission which will allow the RSPB to track their movements every step of the way. But first we have to get to them and the nest is right up high on their hillside. Young eagles fly hundreds of miles to establish their territories. It's important to know more about their flying patterns to help conserve the population. The chicks here are to be fitted with GPS trackers so we can understand more about their movements. Stuart Ben and Brian Etheridge from the RSPB have been monitoring these two since they hatched eight weeks ago. 
they have to move in now to fit the GPS devices, just days before the fully grown chicks fly from the nest for the very first time. It's a steep approach up the mountainside to do this vital work. The good news is that we'll cause little disturbance to the parents as they've already flown off to watch from a safe distance. Disco easy in that. Stuart's going in for one of the chicks. They're quite feisty. They're huge, in fact. It's got the leg, yeah, it's okay. Stage one completed. The chicks will be returned in no time and the parents will be back to feed them as if nothing's happened. How about that? Stuart, what do you think? Healthy? Very healthy, absolutely. Covering the bird's eyes will make the work and a routine health check as stress-free as possible. I can't believe I've got a golden eagle in between my hands. The satellite tags have to be fitted when the chicks are fully grown, so their growth won't be impaired. Each tag only weighs the same as a mouthful of food, so it causes no discomfort. And being solar powered, it's good for up to five years. So obviously we can track where the birds are going, but it's much more than that, really. Unfortunately, there are still people in Scotland, in Britain, who detest golden eagles. They just don't like them at all. And although it's completely illegal and has been for decades, they will quite happily kill these birds. And having satellite tags that tell you where the birds are both allows you to find the bird if it has gone down and hopefully acts as a bit of a deterrent as well. Personally, I'm astonished that some misguided gamekeepers shoot or poison eagles to protect their grouse stocks. Two golden eagle chicks. How good is that? That's really fantastic. There's maybe only 20 or 30 sets of twins reared every year in Scotland out of a population of about 450 pairs. So having twins like this is really, really good. This is a top territory. Look at that poor wingspan. Isn't that amazing? Um, and it's really not even half perfect. Now you can see all the feathers there in pen, can't you? Just coming out of their quills. Gorgeous. This golden eagle chick in my arms has to be the most precious thing I've ever carried. And the best thing of all, when it fledges, we'll be able to track every step of the way, which Glenn, it majestically flies over. <laughs> there you go, wonderful. I don't quite know what that set up professional audio settings means, but um, I might have to try and get rid of that at some point. Um, just very quickly before we go, uh, going right up the top of the, into, into the mountains. Um, for some reason, I can never seem to get my, oh, that's so annoying that is. There we go, lovely. Uh, going up into the mountains, uh, ptarmigan is one of the species that, uh, that everybody wants to see, and it can be quite tough because you have to go quite high, but certainly in the winter, they tend to drop down to the Cairncorn car park so we've got every chance of seeing them there. Uh, in the summer, you have to do a bit of a hike to, to get them because they're usually right on top of the mountains, maybe over 12, 1300 meters. But when you hear them calling with their lovely rolling grrr, call, it's such a super little bird. Um, and obviously the mountain hare, every chance of seeing that down the monoliths and also over Daver Moor. Now, obviously, this one is just already changing its pelage into a winter white snow. It's going to be interesting what happens with climate change going on and less and less snow potentially up in Scotland as these hairs stand out like a like a sore thumb. So I'm just telling you, I'm not uncovering myself. Um, so, yeah, definitely um, every chance of seeing mountain hares up there, which is, of course, our only native hair, because, of course, the, the brown hair is an ancient introduced species and the rabbit of course is a relatively recent introduction so our only native lagomorph is the mountain hare you can see them in the peak district in very very small numbers i filmed them last year actually for the, uh, for inside out 
uh, but certainly getting a chance to see them off it, you've got to go, you've got to go high and you've got to go to the highlands to, to have a good chance of seeing a mountain hare. Uh, just quickly, I mean, look at the I, I plants. I've always talked about how I love the plants up there, Arctic alpine plants. And these, this is halfway up Cairngorm, these lovely flushes where you get the water trickling through. These are brilliant areas for starry saxifrage, which is one of the great plants. And this is a real Bobby Dazzler. This is mountain azalea, which I saw last year. So absolutely thrilled with that. And here's a nice uh, little shot of Corianne Lochen, right at uh, these corries behind, as you can see. I did a little scan, I, a, a, a pano I did with my iPhone, and you can see those big cliffs behind are uh, absolutely fantastic for alpine, Arctic alpine, saxifrages and rose root and all lots of lovely rare plants. So getting a chance to go up and experience the Arctic while staying within Britain is, is a truly magical experience. Very quickly, uh, usually when we go on to the, um, on the highlands, we'll always have a day on the west coast. I look at that, I mean, the west coast is a different flavour, it's much more rugged. Uh, you see a different suite of species as well. I mean, if you don't get white-tailed eagle uh, in Fintorn Valley in Strathburn, then you really should do. We had amazing views of white-tailed eagle on the west coast. We had one eating a fish. We had a juvenile fly right over the top of the minibus. I was blooming wrote it off. I was so excited. Uh, it was a pulled over, jump out, and flying right over the top of our heads. Everyone was, everyone had 300 mil lenses and they were too, too powerful to get the bird in. Because of course we're talking two and a half meter wingspan. And that down there, you can see that bay there is um, probably the best place. Uh, it's, uh, that's Gruinard Bay. And that's probably the best place for black throated divers and great northern divers in Britain in the winter. Guaranteed. Great Northerns. Every single winter trip of lead, red throated, black throated, Great Northern, all three species of diver, we are guaranteed. I have to be very careful saying guaranteed, but they're, they're very good chance. And there you go, look at that. White tailed eagle. Nice adult with a white tail. And the older they get, the paler their heads get as well. Um, seeing it, 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 there's such a different vibe when you see them flying in the air. They've got a much straighter wing, it's like a plank with fingers, a much longer tail, a much longer head. And that kind of gondor bill is so distinctive. The yellow of the bill in the adults is wonderful. I mean, look at that, come on. You're down the monoliths, you lift your binoculars and see one of those bad boys fly over. It's a, it's, it's a red letter day and all the clients are always absolutely thrilled. And I have, every time I see it, um, I, have, I have to say last time I was at the monoliths, we were with, with a bunch of clients and I was the only one with the scope and we watched a golden eagle flying along on this cliff. Uh, and then they all had a great view of it. And then they, they looked at something else and I carried on watching it. And then I saw the golden eagle chasing red deer down the slope, trying to knock the red deer off the cliffs, try, predating them basically. And I tried to get the clients on it, but they couldn't find it. So sorry about that, but it was amazing. Anyway, there we go. Um, Black throat, uh, so that's Great Northern Dive with that weird, really weird, funny double bump head. I mean, Gruinard Bay on our day on the West Coast in the Highlands, Great Northern Diver in the bag. Uh, last shot, because it's all about kind of people I hang out with. I mean, I, I, I love talking about wildlife on television because I'm really passionate about wildlife. And actually, those of you who've been out, have been out with me and Garber, who's still watching, knows me really well, knows I'm a gob on a stick. Um, and I'm really passionate about wildlife and I'm really passionate about talking to people about wildlife as well. I love hanging out with kind of guests, clients. We just become good friends. We kind of just have an amazing time. Sometimes we miss something. Sometimes we see something, um, but we always have fun. I mean, it's not just about what you see during the day. It's about the kind of company and the, and the camaraderie in the evening. Uh, just every trip, we just have a flipping blast. So there's a, a, a bunch of folk, we only could only have groups of five uh, last autumn because of this weird six rule, uh, because of the disease that we're not gonna talk about, that I'm not gonna mention at all, all trip, all, all, all evening. So we only, it was kind of five of me in the minibus and oh, flipping it, we had a good time. That's looking out right on the West Coast and you've got looking right back towards Westeros there and over to the left, um, you can see the whole of the Outer Hebrides. What an amazing place for views. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry, Chris, I've gone slightly over. Um, I got carried away. Um, we'll let you off, Mark. We'll let you off. Quickly, before I hand over to Chris, thank you so much to 
Chris Breen and Dan Free and Chris Smith. Uh, particularly Dan and Dan Free and Chris Smith are my, are my kind of my line managers whenever I do the trips. They're bloody amazing to work with. They're really informative. They kind of keep me in the loop. They keep me employed. They keep me going to amazing places. And um, I look forward to kind of working with, with all of you more and, and seeing and seeing some of some, some of you lovely folk on a trip, be it the levels or be it um, the highlands. I didn't even talk about Mull and Shetland. So maybe we can sort out a talk later in the year, Chris. And of course, I'm going to Madagascar for a couple of trips, hopefully later on September and October this year. So um, fingers, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed if that uh, if the if 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 the C word uh, if the C word stays at bay that's the that's the most important thing. <laughs> hey, Mike, I don't know which question to ask you first. I've got a whole pile here. What a wonderful talk! Thank you so much. That was absolutely super. Your uh, your energy and enthusiasm um, is uh, uh, it should be bottled basically. I think um, <laughs> so. Uh, but look, here we go. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to crack on with, with, with a couple of questions, if I may. First one um, is from a lady by the name of Catherine. Thank you for your question, Catherine. It's about great white egrets. Um, uh, of course, prompted by your, your, your sightings on the sunset levels. Um, how often do you see them and, and how long have they been there? And, um, and I guess, in a sense, why are they there? Because, you know, we see them in Africa, don't we? Why, what are they doing on the sunset levels? It's a bird, Chris, that's, that's basically just flown over from the continent. It's like little egret. It's yeah. come here. I mean, the occasional bird has come here. It's, it's overshot. Uh, the little egret and cattle egret are kind of very widely distributed birds around the yeah. world. A cattle egret actually is one of the very few birds you can see on five continents. Um, yes. So they're, they're basically come here and they're found it to their liking, and particularly because the Avalon marshes is so enormous. I think they've been breeding there for about eight or nine years. And they've been regular for now for about 11 or 12. And there's quite a large flock there now. You are guaranteed to see them. Really? And the first one you see, you go, it's a great white egret. And then after about two days, it's a trash bird. <laughs> <laughs> but it's certainly a good chance of, uh, of photographing it because you can get pretty close to them and they're flipping huge. So they're, they're, there's a, one or two other places where they're breeding, but nowhere like the Somerset levels at the moment. So with, with cattle egrets, cattle egret really is the only place, um, Somerset Love is the only place they breed in Britain, but um, certainly cattle, uh, cattle egret, little egret and great white egret, you can get all three yeah. species on the levels trips. And I've never failed to see all three on any of the trips I've led. Um, so guaranteed to see all three and um, yeah, they're, they're belting birds. Well, that's fantastic. I love seeing the egrets. I, I, I always, um... I always get very excited. I do quite a lot of cycling, as a lot of people know, and I always try and get that in on one of the, on the evening talks. And um, and I love seeing seeing little egrets when I'm cycling. I, I didn't see one this evening, but I did see one yesterday when I was out. They're I have to say, Chris, it's birds. one of the birds that's, that's, that's on my garden less little egrets. Is that because right? I live yeah. in a Chew Valley Lake, and occasionally they roost. I've got a few trees at the bottom of the garden. Occasionally they roost. And the lovely thing about little egrets is they've got black legs. And yes. yellow feet. Yes. And it looks yes. like they've always been standing in a bowl of custard. It's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, yeah. or yellow air fix paint. You don't often see the feet because they're always in mud or in the water, but when you see them properly, they're, they're like they've got yellow feet and black. Yeah, hair. they're great, yeah. aren't they? Aren't they love wonderful? Them. Yeah, love it. Um, so look now, you know, you mentioned you mentioned photography at a certain point then in the in your in your in your answer to the last question. I've had a couple of questions about photography. So uh, would, is, is photography good on the trips, would you say, in the Somerset levels? And of well, course, up in the Highlands, but um, it, are they good, are the trips good for photographers, would you say? Um, uh, primarily, I'm a naturalist. I'm, I'm not like Nick Garbutt in terms of being able to kind of tell them what F stop to shoot at and all that kind of stuff. I always welcome people to take photographs and I will go the extra mile to get them as close as possible. Um, certain things, I mean, Somerset levels, you've got a very good chance of, of, of photographing things like if you're quick, a, a bittern, a marsh harrier with a reasonably long lens, like a 300 mil lens, every chance of most people have got the 100 400 little squash cannon zoom, yeah, which is really good. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the murmurations as well are, are, I mean, in a nice wide angle lens, they're, they're, they're easy to photograph if you get a good one. So, uh, I'm first and foremost a naturalist because I'm too busy finding the, finding the birds. I don't often take my camera with me, unlike Nick. Um, but absolutely, I, we're totally welcome photographers come on it. Scotland 
it can be a little bit more difficult. The golden eagles can be quite distant and the ducks and the divers, sometimes the, the black-throated divers and the red-throated divers are really close. Um, so photographers are more than welcome to come on my trips. I'm very accommodating to them and we'll, we'll go the extra mile to kind of make it happen for them. But certainly, um, yeah, it's take, bring your camera along. I think most people bring their cameras along these days and um, I want to snap away. And, and certainly when we're up in the Highlands, I mean, the crested tip and red, red squirrel photographs that some of the clients got were superb really? uh, last autumn. So certain species, without a shadow of a doubt, are easier. The pine martins, if they come out, I mean, they'll be three metres away, two wow. metres away, but then you, you can't use flashes, so you've got to crank the ISO. Yeah. And yeah. so you end up with a really great shot, but it can be a little bit grainy. But if you're willing to work with me, um, I'm more than happy to kind of uh, get you as close as we possibly can and go the extra mile to get whatever photographs. And it's always brilliant to see the pictures afterwards as well. I, I love that little photo yeah. gallery in the bar. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and um, and so so um, so starling murmurations. That's that's an interesting one and a wonderful one for for photographers, of course. We did a couple of years ago have a very good starling murmuration here in Winchester. Can you believe? It was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. But when is it? Is there a is there a particularly good time for the starling murmuration? Do you reckon? Can you narrow it down? Can you sort of say, well, you know, this two or three weeks is going to be really good, or that two or three weeks is going to be really good, or is it just you know broadly this period? What 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 do you, what do you reckon on that? I've had one or two questions about that. They tend to build up in autumn, so kind of October they're building up. November can be very good. December is, is excellent. January is still good, but then after January, they start to tail away quite quickly. But generally, we're looking kind of November, December, January. So okay. in those three months, um, in many ways, Chris, what's better is if you can pick the right evening. So I would say November, December or January, if you pick a cold, still, clear evening, that's when they're going to be at their best. That's when, if it's windy, they tend to cut, they tend to form the flag, murmurate quite quickly, and then come down to the reeds. Um, or if it's raining, they don't particularly like it either as well. But it's cold and clear and still, that's when you get the really amazing murmurations. So, um, as ever, the, the key thing is knowing because the levels are so massive, what happens is the starlings come down to come down to roost in the reed beds. And there's so many birds, they end up flattening big sections of reed beds. Yeah. So you need to be in the know to know exactly where to stand. So whenever I lead for, for Wildlife World or TTN, I'll go out for a couple of days beforehand and get the gen as to exactly where the starlings are coming down to roost so that yeah. I can get our clients in the best spot. Because it is a, a massive spectacle and we sometimes, sometimes we'll see three or 400 people there. Wow. But hopefully I can, get, I can get you guys in the best spot. And when I know where, when we know where they've gone down, we usually get up early the following morning and then see them leave and just seeing the whole flock just rise up and oh, then just how just wonderful size is belted. So yeah, it's generally November, December, January. If I was to pick one month, I'd say December, but November and January are very good. And the tours I do in January, we've always had huge numbers. Oh, that's very exciting. Very exciting. And um, so look, I'm, I'm conscious that we're, we're at five past nine, but I'm, I am going to ask you a couple more questions. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to go as long as you are. I don't want anyone to get uh, just you know, feel like they've got to go and watch the news or something, but I know I've overrun. <laughs> um, so, so on the Somerset level strip, I'm just going to stick on that one for a minute and then I'll ask you a couple of questions about, about, um, about the Scottish strips. But um, uh how much walking a couple of people have asked us how much walking there there is likely to be you know is it as will it be a, would it be a strenuous trip the, the somerset levels it is an incredibly unstrenuous trip i mean that yeah you won't be going up you won't be going up any hills whatsoever it is as flat as a pancake i would say for example um we do a little bit of a walk on shapwick which might be a kind of a mile there or a mile back but we can easily it's totally flat they're all gravel paths it's not muddy at all it's really really easy walking there are a couple of places where we park the car or park the van and then we go to a hide that's about five yards away yeah um, so, so some places uh, we go up to the um uh, sturt marshes there's a tiny walk there and um, over to the wild, um, the wild, Somerset Wildlife Trust, a really good site, which I've temporarily forgotten the name of, <laughs> uh, just to the northwest of, um, of, of Shapwick. Um, and, and the walk there is five yards into the hide, mm -hmm. cattle egret. So I would say the walks there are 
very, very unstrenuous, very straightforward. Uh, and we can get, we always go at the pace of the slowest person. And I mean, if someone says, oh, I, I fancy having, there's a bench to sit on, or we could, we could go another 100 yards and pick them up on the way back. So it's, it's very, very unstrenuous and very easy, actually. And a lot of people have, have, have found that an absolute joy. Oh, that's that's really super. Thank you very much for that. That's, that's really good to know. Um, so look, just thinking about um, a couple of the trips in, or thinking about the trips in Scotland and a, and a couple of questions relating to those. Um, chances of white-tailed eagle and golden eagle. I know you mentioned them a lot. I mean, they... they, they space they, size. Pardon? In, in the Highlands trips. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very good. I mean, a golden eagle, five out of five. White-tailed eagle five out of five i mean yeah that's, that's what much. i can't guarantee is how close we'll see them right. i mean we've had very very close white-tailed eagles going overhead i mean we're talking 20 meters over our head and we've had golden eagles from 30 40 meters away i mean this is a bird with a flipping huge wingspan chris yeah, yeah so yeah. i mean if you've got a 300 mil lens i mean quite a few clients came away with pictures that were that were just frame filling um i mean the, the lights sometimes might not be might not be brilliant, the, the, the weather can be changeable. But um, white-tailed eagle is slightly more difficult, but you're more guaranteed on the West Coast. And we always have a day over on the West Coast. Yeah. And golden eagle, I mean, Strathburn, Fintorn Valley, I mean, you, 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 we're gonna get them there. We just have to spend a bit of time. And I also go down to Laggett as well, and we've got a very good chance of seeing them there. Um, other, other birds of prey, we had the best Merlin I've ever had really? last year, 10 yards away on a post. Uh, good chance of hen harrier, um, uh, peregrine, guaranteed, kestrel, buzzard. Um, I mean, it's very, very good for raptors. Uh, goshawk, very good in spring. Really? Uh, I've had really, really good goshawk down the Fintorn Valley. So, I mean, we've got a good chance of goshawk as well. Uh, sparrowhawk. So, I mean, raptors are very, very good there. So, uh, and, and a lot of people want to go just for the raptors. Uh, I mean, that's, you know... Ra Raptors is well. They're right. That I, I will be one of those people. Raptors are right at the top of my list wherever I go. I just think. Oh, brilliant, Chris! I love. Yeah, it. I mean, it's quite complicated. I would be very, very disappointed if the if, if the guests or the clients left after a week up in the Highlands trip without us seeing. And certainly, Mull. I mean, Mull is just Eagle Island. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Gold. You know, Dave Sexton's going out with Kate Humble, and I'm going with Nick Davis. Um, I, they obviously know Mull better than me, but I. I know Mull reasonably well. I've, I've been there four or five times before. Um, I mean, Mull is Eagle Island. I mean, it, Golden Eagle, White-tailed Eagle and Otter are top of the list. And certainly in the Highlands. I mean, Otter's been a little bit of a tricky one for us. Normally we go to, um, normally we go, uh, to the top of Loch Ness to look for, look for Otter. It was, it was a little bit hit and miss in the autumn, but I'm very hopeful of certainly Otter on the West Coast or certainly kind of north of Speyside. So um, yeah, Eagles and Otters, West Coast. And, low, and, and and eagles definitely on, on on the highland trips oh that's very exciting so i've, I've got two more questions for you mike sure thing. Um, first is from is from charles um who says when is a good time to see the black grouse lecking in the highland black grouse. um charles uh, black grouse are certainly spring um but the funny thing is that they drop off in the summer the summer's not a great time but most people seem to think that black grouse lek in march and april uh, just in march and april but all autumn trips we saw them we saw males lecking on the on, on the lek and i've got a lek that i go to where we see um it's it's hard to photograph them unless you've got 500 mil lens but i mean i get my i take my scope up and we get we get fantastic views of them there they're probably about 300 yards away which is quite good for a black grouse lek um but they're they're lecking they're lecking right the way through autumn right the way through winter um, but March and I'd say if a key month is March, but you could yeah. I would think you could probably see them six, seven months of the year. Wow. And there's a site we go to, which is about 15 minutes from the hotel, and the males are going <laughs> and then going <laughs> and you get them fighting, it's like handbags at dawn. So black grouse <coughs> we've had on every single trip I've led with Brilliant. you guys up there. So that's another pretty much cast iron. Hopefully. Cast iron one, like the head, like your head, like the top of your head. Um, um, so look, uh, fi final question, which I think is a great one. You and I chatted about this before kickoff earlier, um, uh, which has been asked by David, which uh, I I'm sure you're asked it all the time. 
Um, but it's still a lovely question. Um, what bird or mammal um, are you desperate to see that you haven't yet seen? Uh, can I, if I could choose a, in Britain, bird and mammal. Okay. Um, this, this book I've got behind me, Chris, which, I, which I've got right here, which is my Bruce Campbell Guide to Birds and Colour, which I shared a picture of. And if I can, if I can bring it, put up to the microphone, you can see my curly, whirly copper plate, my name, mm -hmm. Michael Dilger. Yeah. Um, there's 256 different birds in this book, uh, Chris, and I've seen 255 of them. The only oh, one I've not the other one. seen is quail. I mean, oh. it's, it's what we call, a, a birders call it a tart tick. It's like, given my level of knowledge about birds, it's a bird I should have seen. And I've heard them, and we've, we had them on the Somerset Levels trip on two of the trips, calling right by the van. Um, and it's in, a, it's in these fields on the Somerset Levels, where you're not allowed to trespass, <laughs> just <laughs> exactly. desperate to trespass. So we all heard them really, really well. Um, they go, it's like wet my lips, wet my lips. I've still never seen quail. So that's the bird I most want to see. The mammal I most want to see, which I still have not seen is Scottish wildcat. Um, I live in hope that we're going to catch one on one of the trips. Um, yeah. It is desperately difficult primarily because uh, a lot of domestic tabbies are out there are hybridizing with Scottish wildcats. Um, uh, but I still haven't seen Scottish wildcat. I, uh, I, you, you need to see one and then we can rename the trip the following year, the Scottish wildcat trip. Scottish wildcat experience. The Scottish wildcat safari. And I'm really hopeful that kind of beavers are going to be doing well up there. And I mean, let's hope that lynx is going to be released soon because yeah. I mean, lynx are just going to disappear into the forest and stop predating on roe deer. So, I mean, ho hopefully, you know, five years time, uh, Chris will be leading, leading trips going to look for, uh, for, look for lynx. Who's oh, to say? I mean, I'm really, really hopeful that lynx will be released fairly soon. But Scottish wildcat and, uh, and uh, quail are the two species, both of which, one is a levels bird, one is a highland bird, one's highland one is bird. a highland mammal, I've seen blooming neither. <laughs> um, Mike, look, thank you so much. Thank you so much for a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody, for all of the questions you've asked. I do apologise to those of you um, who've put questions on the chat that I haven't been able to ask, Mike, um, Nicola, Paul, um, Chris and, and others. I do apologise. Um, I'm very conscious that it's now quarter past nine and um, and, and we've run over a bit, but you, you can't not run over when, um, uh, when there's so much passion and excitement and... Um, enthusiasm about these wonderful places that we have in this great country of ours um so mike thank you so much once again um really great to, to be with you this evening um, my absolute pleasure i really really enjoy leading i enjoy sharing my passion of wildlife and i enjoy uh, leading for wildlife worldwide and, and the traveling naturalists i'm looking forward to a, a fantastic year ahead uh, doing all manner of great stuff with you and i look forward to seeing hopefully some of the guests um to spend some time and have a hoot, <laughs> be it on the levels of the Highlands or Mull or Shetlands or Madagascar or wherever. Yeah, or wherever. Hey, Mike. Thank you, for, thank you for everyone coming, spending their evening to come and listen to me and Chris bang on. Thank you so much, Mike. All the best. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Cheerio.